dial in. But welcome to the uh, um, uh, uh, this session of a, new, a, a trial session of AMA, uh, which is uh, Ask Me Anything. Mary had thought of this one, which um, I'm excited about, which is a more of just a casual discussion of various questions you want to ask Mary and I uh, and about about us, about the department, about what pro programs are coming up, what our goals are for the next year, six months, 10 years, 20 years, whatever, whatever you all can think of. Or if you're interested in finding out what happened to, you know, a favorite artifact of yours or a site or just anything else or areas that you'd want to you know, look at for, uh, for archaeology. It's really open to um, uh, just about anything. I would really like to know how both of you landed at Montpelier. Mm. Mary, <laughs> why don't you go ahead with that? That's one of my favorite stories. I love that expedition. <laughs> um, so I came to Montpelier as an expeditioner. Um, so when I was in graduate school at the University of Maryland, a former staff member um, used to work here, Stefan uh, Wolke, and he was doing his dissertation work on, on sites from Montpelier. And he said to a group of us like, hey, um, for spring break, why don't you guys all come down to Montpelier? We're, they're doing a metal detecting expedition and you can learn how to metal detect. And um, we're also gonna be digging on my dissertation site and you can help me. And there are scholarships for it. And I was like, okay, cool, what's Montpelier? Why do I know how to metal detect? Like, I didn't know anything to be very honest. And, um, but it sounded like a great thing. And um, when I was at the University of Maryland, we had such a really good camaraderie amongst the graduate students of anytime anybody needed help, everybody just, kind of rallied around them and said, yeah, you need extra hands. Let me come help you work on your site. I can learn something, be on a cool site and you can get your stuff done. Um, so there was a group of us that spent our spring break um, here. It was March. So it snowed buckets the first night, Sunday night. Mm -hmm. um, we were in Arlington house, uh, staying in the basement and it just, the snow would not stop. And by the end of the week, I think it was 80 degrees. Um, but we spent a lot of time I worked a lot with Lance. I learned how to use a metal detector. I had a great experience. I worked on the site. I got to know a lot of the interns um, at the time who some of them like Scott Oliver, I became friends with and have become good friends with over the years. And um, I don't know, gosh, maybe two years. And then after that, I knew Matt. And so we mm -hmm. just kept running into each other at conferences and talking and, and hanging out and getting along. And the job came open and I turned to my friend, Stefan, and I said, hey, are you applying for this? And he said, no. I said, well, I think I want to. I think this would be a really good fit for me, the public components of it. And at that time I was working in the curation facility for the parks, National Park Service. And he said, yeah, and I came down for the interview. I took a zip car from Washington, DC mm -hmm. down here mm -hmm. because I didn't have a car um, and did my interview. And uh, the first thing I remember Matt saying to me was, oh my God, I'm so sorry I spilled that gin and tonic on you at a conference. <laughs> and I was like, well, I had forgotten about it. So that's great. And then the next thing he asked me was, what are you working on? And at the time I was working on stuff he had excavated from a NASA's national battlefield, getting it updated into the Park Service's updated uh, database system. And I said, well, actually I'm working on all your old projects. And then I went out uh, later that day, went out to lunch with Terry and he and I had become friends through conferences over the years. And I said, well, what are you looking for? And he said, I'm looking for really a friend and a colleague to have here. And I was like, well, I'm your friend already. So I think this would be a good fit. And, um, and I think the only other thing I remember was uh, that solidified at least my interview process here is that I had packed two pairs of shoes one as a formal dress heel and one um, and a pair of like flat boots so I could like get into the units and walk around the sites. Um, and I, one of the interns at the time who then later became a staff member, Liz McCaig, remembered that I had brought two pairs of shoes and she was impressed by that. Um, <laughs> so 
that's how I got to Montpelier was I started as an expeditioner and fell in love with the place and the programs and um, found my way back here a couple of years later. So Matt, how'd you end up here? <laughs> yeah, well, um, related to what you're, you were mentioning, Mary, I was at Manassas Battlefield doing those projects that you, that you would later go back and recatalog and integrate into the uh, digital database that the Park Service had. But I was, um, when I was working at Manassas Battlefield, I was, uh, this is back from 97 to 2000. I, I had just finished my dissertation working on um, uh, two slave settlements down in Jamaica. And I was applying for academic jobs and had a couple of interviews at, uh, for faculty positions. And, um, but I loved doing the work at Manassas, looking, you know, working on plant the many plantations that were there. It's like about 6,000 acres there at Manassas. And I started to um, write uh, historic homes about, you know, developing our archaeology programs because there were no director of archaeology positions available because they were all filled, like at Monticello, at um, Mount Vernon, and all these other places. And kind of my dream had always been to um, to work, you know, at a, at one place that had a large amount of acreage and really get into an in-depth study of that landscape and also pair that with a, um, uh, you know, beginning to, to, to bring together the community, especially the descendant community in archeology. span And so I started writing these various historic homes. I wrote a lot of them that were in the, the Hudson River Valley is really interested in the African-American community in the Hudson, up and down the Hudson River Valley uh, floodplain. And, um, you know, I was contacting him and writing him about, you know, how we could um, uh, apply for, um, you know, various NEH grants and, and get uh, programs developed that would bring in income. And so I was finding ways to make it so that if they employed me, I would pay my way in the program. And amongst all, uh, when all this was, when I was doing this, because um, I knew that the contract was coming up at Manassas and the next project was going to be doing riparian buffer surveys, which is basically surveying all along the stream valleys, which, and it would need to be done in the summer and the spring, uh, which would have been covered in poison ivy and just sounded like a real nightmare to me. <laughs> um, and there was no real permanent position at Manassas, so it was contract to contract and had, you know, two kids, kids at the time, a young family and was trying to find a place to settle down. Um, and so the position at Montpelier came open and I was just like, my God, this is my dream job. So I, um, you know, wrote a letter, uh, you know, the cover letter in about 20 minutes because I just readapted all these letters I've been writing to all these other places. And also, uh, you know, started uh, cold calling then Mike Quinn, who was the director. And we finally got a hold of him and we got into conversations about, you know, funding. And that's in the end what really sold him on you know, uh, moving me to the top of the list was, you know, be, he wanted somebody that would be able to, um, to pay for themselves in the, in the role of archaeology and, and not just, you know, kind of assume that the position was permanent and it was going to be uh, funded forever. So, but what really sold me on the place was just that, um, you know, what an amazing plantation it was, the surveys that Lynn Lewis and, and, and uh, Scott Parker had done earlier. A, a bo my boss, our mutual boss, Mary's and my boss, uh, um, Stephen Potter, had given me this as a, um, as a, which is a survey of Montpelier that was written in 1984. And it basically outlined all these sites that were there. And basically that in a nutshell, you know, the changes that had happened through time, like in terms of the 18th century landscape, the Georgian landscape of, of the, the main house, and then changing over to this, uh, this uh, neoclassical uh, landscape. And it just, you know, spoke to the kind of uh, changes that would show up in the archaeological record with large amounts of landscaping and changing to the plantation regime. And it just, this place turned out to be way beyond a, what, I ever expected. And then in addition to that, the community, uh, the descendant community that's here is like, you know, none that I've ever met in terms of, you know, the, the, the continuity that they have with the land and the connection that would they have this with this place and how they want to help us succeed. It's just fantastic. So that's what brought me and kept me here. So, and, and then working with folks like Mary has definitely made it. So I want to keep on staying here. No question. 
If, yeah. If you're, if you're done, Matt. I'm done, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt. No, you're but, perfect okay. timing. Speaking, speaking of the descendant, uh, uh, Montpelier's descendant community, what, my question is, what questions does the Montpelier descendant community have that they would like answered by archeological research? Hmm. That's one that we're continuing to explore, but I'd say one of the, some of those fascinating questions that they've brought up is, you know, how, you know, when we, when we interpret the, um, the house and James, James and Dolly Madison, we don't just talk about, you know, his, um, his, the, the work that he did in his politics, we talk about his intellectual life and his intellectual philosophy and the, um, and what the descendants have asked us to do is address those same questions to their ancestors. You know, what, you know, they're very interested in learning about the work that their ancestors did, but what were their intellectual contributions to this place? And that's something that's really guided our research and the questions that we ask of, you know, the sites. So it's, it goes beyond just saying, oh, we've got a tobacco barn here, or we've got a set of fields that we found from LIDAR out in the, out in the, in the what, today's woods. And this must have been something that the Madisons instructed the laborers to work on, what labor, the enslaved laborers to work on. What it's about inspired us to do is to begin to look at these and see what contributions the enslaved community made to that. And what would have been the, the inspiration for them to, you know, manipulate the land and what we're seeing in like say the ditches out in the east woods where it's clear that those have been engineered to the point where they don't have to be maintained they, they still carry the water load today without being maintained and having these these ditches maintain themselves meant that the enslaved community didn't have to engage in labor to do that that they designed them so that they would always clear themselves out and not override the banks which means they would have more time for their own pursuits, you know, working their own gardens. So, you know, looking for ways that looking, not just taking for granted that all the intellectual work of designing the plantation was in the hands of the Madisons, looking at how, you know, what, what was the expertise of the enslaved community and how we can see that in the archeological record. Mary, you've been working on some uh, uh, work with the descendant community. Uh, especially with the um, the um, the one grant you were looking at with uh, the the digital databases and some of the training you were talking about, we were just talking about this over not in person but over in a in a paper we're putting together with Terry in a Google Doc comment. <laughs> Google Doc comment, yeah. But you had talked to me about it before, which I think is really some really cool ideas. Yeah. So a lot of what I've been dealing with is less about. Um, maybe less about research questions, but more about questions kind of that are kind of wearing my curator hat that really we deal with where often the job of the curator is to be a gatekeeper. So I tell people all the time that there are over 3 million archeological artifacts in our collection and less than 0.1% of them are currently on exhibit. So, and then people go, well, who makes that decision? And for a long time, it's been, me or whoever's been in my position and really shifting the power of that decision making of who, uh, you know, with what artifacts and objects get to be displayed also affects what stories are being told and how those stories are being told and how those artifacts are being interpreted. Same with sites. Um, uh, because you can dig the same site or look at the same artifact and interpret it different ways, depending on the questions you're asking it and that the knowledge you're bringing with it, sort of the context surrounding it. But also down to what artifacts are going to get conserved, which ones deserve the extra care, which ones should be prioritized for digitization, which ones should be accessible to the public and which ones should be held um, kind of more privately for the descendant community or components of them. So really thinking about um, not just sort of the, the research questions at the beginning, but thinking about how the care of the objects and the information um, can, those decisions can be made collaboratively and, and in an informed way. So um, working with descendants where they can 
um, work with outside trainers or, or outside experts um, so they can help make those decisions for care. They can make those decisions for conservation. They can make those decisions for interpretation, for exhibition, and um, use their experience and their knowledge as descendants, but also have sort of a, uh, be more prepared and have a cursory background in, you know, digitization or material culture or um, archeological interpretation. So, um, so there doesn't feel like the automatic um, deference to the experts. So a lot of what I've been uh, talking to members of, of the uh, Descendant Committee about through this grant application process, um, which was applying for the National Endowment of the, National Endowment for the Humanities grant to get our collections digital and accessible is what does that look like? Who's making those decisions? Who's doing that work? Um, who's getting compensated for that work? Uh, so those, those kinds of things and really reshaping this idea of gatekeeper um, and uh, kind of democratizing it. So who else? Does anybody else have questions for us? And you can put them in the chat or you can ask them directly. Well, okay, I'll ask another one. Okay, Debbie. Debbie and then Pat, I think, had one. Well, I'll let them go first then. Okay. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for the work that you're doing with the descendant community there at Montpelier. Um, we have long visited historic sites like Mount Vernon and Montpelier and the story is always about how great this man, this white man was and what he accomplished. And in the background was this fabulous estate that he lived on. But for many, many years, it seemed just like some sort of well-oiled machine. And like in Mount Vernon, I know some of that attention is changing there, but it was how um, George Washington decide, designed all this for the time, modern farming techniques. Mm. Jefferson invented all these things and hybridized vegetables and things. But what we've come to realize is they probably didn't do it with their own hands. Somebody did it. And it was the enslaved community and hired laborers that really had the knowledge and the talent and, and put the work into it. And I think Montpelier just so highlights that the mere distinction of color is an emotionally moving um, exhibition that I, I just found completely changed my thinking about how our, our country was founded. And um, I wanna thank you for that. And now when we visit other historical sites, that's the same kind of thinking I bring to them and how they present their their various histories. So I just want to say thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming and supporting. And um, if, if people leave this place with a better understanding of a broader history and a more critical eye of looking at the past, mm -hmm. that's the greatest compliment I think that anyone could ever give us is because that's our goal, right? Is that we can all look at our history, look at the past of this country and look around us and think about, well, what are the other sources of information? What is the part of the story that, that we're not learning and we're, what we're not telling? And that's such a useful skill for everyday <laughs> components of our life. And so it, thank it you really, for saying that. It, it relates to what's going on in modern times, people's perspective of how they see things, you know, things in the news and, and whatever, it's your perspective. I remember one visit down to Montpelier, um, I think we were coming to visit for the overseer's house, but um, I'm trying to think somebody, somebody, there was a table with artifacts on it. So the thing I love about Montpelier is you can actually hands on see this stuff and pick it up. Hmm. But there was a, a broken piece of a teacup that was found in the tobacco barn. And the question was asked, why was there a teacup in the tobacco barn when, you know, tobacco barns are for like drying tobacco but it just, it just made you think and realize a person was in there and were they sitting down and taking a break? You know, did they use the teacup to get some water or was it, was it their version of a Starbucks break or uh, 
whatever, but it really, that little piece of tikka really humanized the plantation for me. Yeah, that, thanks for that, Pat. That one um, thing I realized the other day is that so often when we talk about, you know, there's the, the three parts of Montpelier that we talk about. It's the, um, it's uh, James Madison. You know, this is kind of the classic, you know, um, uncritical view of, of the place. There's James Madison, there's Montpelier and the constitution. And this is something that has been, you know, talked about for, for decades here. You know, what are the kind of the three pillars of what make this place? And the Montpelier, is really a, um, you know, the place of Montpelier in so many ways is just, it's a substitute for saying the enslaved community because without the enslaved community, there would literally and figuratively be no Montpelier. You know, there wouldn't be the structures that were built. There wouldn't be the spaces that were created because the enslaved community built those. And then like you're alluding to so much of the knowledge of that, you know, where the clay came from, for making the bricks. Like uh, uh, the example I love of this is that during the restoration, John Jeans, the, the, the director of restoration at the time had the idea that, hey, you know, they, the, the, um, the uh, Mason Hugh Chisholm made the bricks at Montpelier, we should do that as well. So he um, hired a Mason to come in, contracted them to come in and mine clay from an area just down the site where we're, we're excavating today, very scarily close to that site. And he, the, the Mason spent about six months extracting the clay from a pit, fire, you know, mixing it, firing it. And when he delivered the bricks and took them off the truck, they literally fell apart. And, and they were, they were, the bricks were just no good. And the problem was, is that the, the clay that was used for those bricks wasn't that wasn't clay, it was more of a silty clay. And it wasn't the clay that was necessary that it hold up under firing. And what was lost in this was the information of where good sources of clay would be for manufacture of brick. And that wouldn't, that, is, that doesn't come from, you know, some scientific study of the land. It comes from knowing the land and plowing it and knowing the texture of that soil when you're working it agriculturally what would be good for, for, for potting? What would be good for brick making? And this is all in the, in the, um, in, in the, in the intellectual uh, um, database of the enslaved community through oral history through, you know, by the time you get to 1810, 90 years of working and knowing the land. And so what has been lost at Montpelier with the, the sale of the community in the 1840s is this collective information and it's kind of been subsumed under you know you know ass assumption of the dot you know madison knowing this and so it's something that you know saying montpelier you're saying you it's just if you substitute for the for montpelier the enslaved community it all begins to make this place into what was lived and the 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 the, the, the um the real lived experiences of the people that made it and that's what you know, brings us all here, whether to study it, whether to come and dig, whether just, you know, visitors just to visit is to understand this human experience. And it's really important. And the descendant community has given us this perspective, you know, by saying, you know, these are ancestral lands, our ancestors did this, find this out for us, use your expertise as archaeologists to do this. And so that's where, you know, we're moving towards being more of a service-based institution and but more relevant for archaeology department to answer questions that the public has but especially the descendant community has and really appreciate all of your all support in you know our work with the community because it's meant a lot it's really it, it's pushed it along in, in what we've been doing through the years hello donna see see you there in your kitchen how are you doing <laughs> Debbie, did you have another question? Oh, okay. You remember? <laughs> <laughs> Let me see how to put this. Since the property has so many sites that you've just found, like on surveys and things, how do you determine what's what you're going to do when and you know? Because I know 
<clears throat> it's a long term process because you need to apply for grants and things like that. But just, I'm just curious how you decide what you're going to tackle. Yeah, for a long time ago, like 20 years ago, it was determined based on like when it began at Montpelier on what sort of construction projects were happening, like the construction of the visitor center or the bridge or the restoration of the main house. And then I'd say about uh, by 2006, it started to switch to more of what our priorities were for interpretation. Yeah. And um, uh, part of this was determined by, you know, what was in close proximity to the visitor center in the main house mm -hmm. and what visitors could see. A lot of this came from discussions with the, with the community in terms of what was within close proximity and needed the highest priority. And today, you know, that, you know, like you're alluding to, we've got 2,650 acres. And so we're expanding to way beyond just the visitor core. And this is, um, you know, answering that question is going to be one where, you know, like Mary was alluding to with the collections, is that we want to have a have a lot more engagement with our constituent base, especially the descendant community, but all of you all as well in terms of what is what are sites that can tell the story in the most effective way and have the most meaning and the partnership we have and the uh, co-stewardship we have with the descendant community is going to be a big uh, part of this in terms of you know uh, basically you know reviewing what sites we found what areas we've looked at what areas we haven't um, and then start to um, really begin to define what each of these sites has the potential to tell us about Montpelier as a as a plantation as a community and what 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 would be the priority? How would we begin to prioritize answering these questions? You know, whether is it public access? You know, with walking trails, is it is it importance or sacredness of sites like the 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 uh, burial grounds for the enslaved community? And, and there's many of those. There's one at the Gilmore Farm for the Gilmore family. There's mm -hmm. the most you know the one that we're working on right now, which is the uh, um, the slave cemetery proper just down the hill from the visitor center. But there's another slave cemetery that's on the um, on the northern part of the property that we think is one that's associated with an adjacent plantation uh, called um, called uh, uh, Tetley, and so you know how to decide that is you know getting getting to have these kind of community discussions is super important. I would just build on that as one thing that it, there's space, but there's also time. We have 8,000 years of history on the property. I think our oldest artifacts are 8,000 years old. So it's it's there's a lot of space, but there's a lot of time. And so picking the sites that help us tell the story often have been dictated by what's our period of interpretation. So what are we trying to do on the landscape? What are we focusing on? Um, but a great way we've been able to kind of reach beyond that is with working with graduate students. So, so often um, interns and former employees uh, like Stefan who brought me down here, he was working on sort of a lot of interesting post-Madison occupation of, of the property um, was a lot of the, what he was interested in. And so kind of reaching and building those relationships with students or other researchers who maybe are interested in earlier or later time periods can allow us to kind of build our understanding of the place without just Montpelier staff having to do the work. And I think that that's really important because we have this amazing resource of information, not just for the Madison time period, but extending both before and after, um, you know, that 1722 to 1844, pretty tight window of the, the, the three Madison generations. So thinking about whether it's Gilmore or the Civil War encampments or thinking about the Native American sites that are on the property and really trying to make all of that information accessible to other researchers who can connect in to what we're doing as part of bigger projects or um, kind of uh, do additional research, additional uh, information that can be gathered from what we've already done. Yeah, I, I was going to ask about that. Uh, so thank you very, Mary, for those <laughs> comments. But uh, in, in addition, I wonder if you could give us some idea of the kinds of issues that these other researchers that are not 
you know, what kind of research are they doing with uh, Montpelier's 3 million artifacts <laughs> and other information they get, you know, just, just some examples of the kinds of things they've been able to do or are in the process of doing. So I can give you a couple of examples of actually things we've been doing with faunal remains. So um, one thing that uh, they, uh, also a group of researchers have been doing is tracking introductions of domesticated rabbits into North America. Um, and they've been taking, um, I think it's rabbit calcaneuses, so like rabbit ankle bones from all across uh, 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 North America to see when certain um, English born rabbits were brought in and how they spread. And so we submitted some rabbit bones in 2020 for part of that study. Um, and so they're doing a, um, all sorts of different kind of chemical analysis as well as uh, you know sort of osteological analysis looking at that. There was another uh, researcher out in Canada who was looking at um, the spread of the black rat. So uh, um, black rats, as opposed to domestic rabbits that would have been brought intentionally, uh, black rats came over on boats unintentionally. And so watching the spread of rats can also help you understand the spread of disease and the spread of people and this, all of those kinds of things. So he wanted rat bones. So actually I have sitting next to me, uh, the box of rat bones he shipped back to me <laughs> that I sent to him. Um, and so sometimes it's part of just this tiny little contribution into this much, much bigger project, these really big questions um, about movements of people and animals and diseases and kind of these very big things. And then sometimes it's really um, kind of tighter and, and more, more specific to the specific place or connecting this place to the surrounding, you know, Orange community or Central Virginia or kind of the Mid-Atlantic. Um, but those were two that were really fun and really outside of the box and something um, I would never do. Like for my research, it would never, I would not, that would not be part of, of kind of the work that I would ever even have the chance to do. So those were just two that we did um, last year um, uh, that, were we were actually approached by outside researchers to to use our collections for that type of stuff. Um, so, uh, thank you, Nancy. Uh, and yeah, what what you stated, Mary, like in terms of the collaborative research, that's it, it, those are incredible opportunities. And one one way we do that is by making sure that our colleagues know what we're doing. And this can be everything from conference papers to papers that we write as part of edited volumes and even you know applying for grants, uh, but then definitely through social media. So the, the kind of outreach that we do to, you know, to have you know, such a great group of folks like you all who come on programs and help us with volunteering, both virtually and in person, that also pertains to our you know, fellow archeological colleagues and being open to really making sure that everybody knows what sort of data we've got and that we, we, we wanna share it. And that's a, an incredibly, it provides like the examples that you talked about, Mary, just some incredible opportunities for, um, for new research that we would never even think of. Yeah, even I was just remembered that, um, oh gosh, kind of, uh, a little bit over a year ago, one of um, uh, the archaeologists for the Department of Historic Resources was doing a whole survey of um, educational artifacts found across Virginia. So things like slate mm. pencils and writing slates, Laura Galky was. And she reached out and said, I know you have this because I've seen it on an exhibit there or something. What else do you have besides just this small simplet, that snippet that I've seen? So it's been, it's really fun. And a lot of what I get to do is filter a lot of those contacts and dig through and go, yes, we have this thing that mm -hmm. nobody's seen in 20 years. Let me get it to you. Let it have new life and help answer new questions, which is really fun. Um, and I and I missed Nancy's question. I just, I, it, just the top part popped up. It said, yeah. in regards to your democracy, in regards to democratizing your findings, which I love, uh, is there a way right now for K through 12 students to access and study independent of school? So 
at least with uh, in regards to the uh, the digital collections project, which is the, our effort to get all of our collections digitized and online and accessible. One of the things that we are doing and in that whole planning of that process has been to have teachers in the conversation and educators in the conversation of when this stuff goes online, how do we make it something that can be used in the classroom um, by teachers, by students. Um, and they were at our earliest planning meetings and have been part of that process. But that's, a, that's kind of a long-term goal. On the more immediate, we've been doing some with specific school districts. So we have a relationship with Albemarle County Schools where we're doing projects with them. And part of what we were doing is um, making not only our documentary resources, but other things accessible, um, some of our archeological artifacts accessible for them as a form of primary sources. So we think of primary sources as just written documents, but primary sources are also objects and archeological artifacts. So getting them photographs, digital photographs of artifacts, little bits of background information, have, getting them access to kind of our websites and the things that are available um, for that kind of more limited group of students to use. Um, and then we've also, uh, this year, this summer, we had an entire expedition program of high school students. Mm -hmm. So really trying to build more relationships with uh, students, high school students in the region, but also students from across the country. Um, and one of my favorite high school students of all time, whoever came here, was a young woman by the name of McLaren Guthrie. And Mac came here as a high school student all the way from Indiana, did an expedition with us, but also spent an extra week working in the lab with me and has gone on, gone to college, graduated, came here this summer, worked as an intern for us um, as she uh, moves into her master's program where she's doing on archeology span right now. So we put our little claws into them when they're young and then watch them grow up and, and blossom. And Max just watching her, um, grow as an archaeologist has been a really cool experience and really fun. Um, for those of you who've gotten to work with Mac or, or have gotten to meet her, um, she's she's pretty great. And that's how <laughs> that's how long you know you've been here, Mary, because she came here as a high school student and now she's a graduate student. That's when you begin to be like, oh my goodness, how long has it been? Well, <laughs> and we're, we're, we're super excited there um, in the same field school that Mac was helping us teach we had a teacher that came on a teacher program, Carissa Trotta from North Carolina, who's now, who, who came on the field school, which was amazing. She had come on, she's come on about three, three or four different programs. She did the field school this summer. And then she's bringing a group of her students from North Carolina in January to do our um, plantation below the canopy program, where they're going to um, not work in an excavation unit, but they're going to work with us doing um uh, identification of old growth trees in the, in the forest, mapping those in, measuring the girth and identifying the species, helping uh, uh, assist dentists with the metal detector surveys, and then also doing some shovel test pits in some of these areas where we've got these fields that are, um, they're terraced fields that have the, have the ditches in it. So we're looking forward to that program and, and it'll, it'll be a, you know, in the winter in the woods, which is the only time to be in the woods. Um, oh, Elise, you asked, please discuss interesting finds discovered at the grave sites of the enslaved. What was the average lifespan? Yeah, we, um, I'd say the most interesting one that we've found is, is not through subsurface archaeology, because we haven't done any subsurface archaeology of grave sites yet at Montpelier. Um, we, there has been some done in the Madison Family Cemetery, but not in any of the, uh, the uh, cemeteries that were um, used by Black Americans at Montpelier. But at Gilmore, we found, this is through oral history, Rebecca Gilmore Coleman told us about the grave site of her great-grandparents, George and Polly Gilmore. Their bed was positioned, the headboard and the footboard at the grave site. And the evidence for that is, is gone except for a piece of, of angle iron that's in the ground that we believe held that bed in place. Um, we're worried that the bed was removed in the 1980s by a group that came in and cleaned up the cemetery after it was found by archeologists. And this is this kind of horror story that archeologists cringe at where, you know, well-meaning Boy Scouts are 
other scouts come in and clean up the cemetery and remove all the grave goods because it would have looked like a bed was abandoned in the cemetery, but this was a bed of the Gilmores. And it actually was a special bed because it was an iron bed. And that would have been something that they would have had to save a lot of money for and would have been, you know, when you look at um, uh, oral histories that have been done of African-American families, an iron bed was a sign of status. And that's something that would be, you know, an object that would be put at a grave, you know, as one of the most treasured items of the, uh, of the couple. But that's, what, one thing we're working on right now with the memorialization project is we are going to be doing surveys and excavations at the slave cemetery and how to recover these items is one thing that we're going to be engaged in discussions with the with the Montpelier descendant committee on and there's several possibilities there's you know obviously excavation units to find the grave shafts and are so far the discussions of are leaning towards just having the excavations be limited to the grave shafts and not disturbing any human burials. But then also want to um, discuss the possibility of doing metal detector surveys, you know, near surface metal detector surveys in the cemetery to try to see if there's any evidence of grave goods, just like you're alluding to, Elise, in the cemetery. And that's something that we'd need to have some serious discussions in terms of you know, how to do those surveys, what is the descendant community's desires in terms of, you know, putting those objects back in place, whether to temporarily re remove them for study, photography, exhibition, you know, what, you know, because these are, you know, burial spots are obviously very personal. And this is something that, you know, it's a model that we want to use for the cemetery because of precedent there. But it's also one we want to open this discussion for, like Mary was alluding to, for all the objects. I mean, there are objects that, you know, traditionally we put on display based on our own, you know, academic curiosity as museum uh, um, curators or our, and as, as researchers. But what we want to begin to do is bring the community into this question because these are objects that are owned and used by their ancestors and have meaning that go beyond just a scientific or a museum curio, uh, you know, curio but something that's very personal. And it's, it's um, you know, one thing we wanna do is, is learn about that to understand how to make interpretations that re are respectful to the descendants of the, the people that sacrificed so much to make, make this place what it was. Um, I would say the other sort of interesting finds at the sites is really just kind of looking at the plantings, um, the plant life mm, that's around yeah. the burial sites as we think so much about, you know, artifacts or digging. I certainly spend a lot of time thinking about artifacts, but um, reading the landscape, looking at whether it's field stones used as markers or plantings, kind of the, the vinca or the periwinkle that covers up, looking, um, doing plant surveys can be really, really helpful in burial sites. Um, not at Montpelier, but at a cemetery site I worked at in Pensacola, Florida. We did a, uh, we had, they had a full um, botanical survey of the cemetery site. And it's a site that's been used since the British occupation of Florida. Um, so pre-revolution um, 18th century. And one of the things they found in that cemetery was a plant called African lovegrass, which is a plant that is native to the continent of Africa and not found anywhere else in Pensacola. Um, and so finding certain trees, certain plants, um, very specific ones, you know, whether it's lilies, which are very common in planted uh, uh, in cemeteries, but looking at all of these as pieces of information and ways that people were honoring um, their ancestors um, in the past, I think is, is really informative. So really kind of taking a very holistic approach to understanding cemeteries is um, can be really informative and beneficial. And it makes, you know, then calls into a question about if you're looking at the plants and the plants really are artifacts of the people as well, how much ground disturbance do we want to do? Um, so um, I would real quick, quick touch on Melanie's question. Hi, Melanie. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to hear from you. Um, so the software we're going to use for our collections project to get it online is uh, an open source software called Cora which was developed at Michigan State University. Um, and so rather than using kind of a proprietary out of the box, like Rediscovery or um, EMU or any of those kind of museum 
traditional ones. So it's going to be really a custom build for us, which is going to allow us to not only get archaeological information online and available, but all of our collections. So decorative arts, preservation and architecture, as well as documents and archives um, into one system that each will kind of be custom made for us, um, but all integrated. And then it will also allow us to do through a system of permissions, um, not only staff have permissions of saying this is what's accessible or this is how it's interpreted, but members of uh, the dissent committee as well. Um, so one thing I love that you introduced uh, Mary to the concept of, of collections, archeological collections is all the paperwork. And that's, uh, you know, for, for getting the paperwork online, that's where like Dean, you could answer that question. What software are you using to, you know, you and all the other volunteers and Pat to digitize everything? Or oh, ArcGIS. Yeah, GIS, woo, GIS. So yeah, yeah. it's, uh, so uh, Pat, it, Pat and Dean have been, for the past year, been digitizing, uh, and, and Beth as well, I see there as well, Beth, have been digitizing um, the, uh, our legacy data of strata cards all the way back from you know, the 90s into 2004 and putting it all into GIS. And what's great about GIS is that we're using the online version of it, which means that all this is available to the public. So they're linking in, you know, digitizing in the, in the maps and the location of the uh, stratum that are excavated, entering all the excavation data, but then linking the photos to that as well. So what we can do is have a public archive where, you know, we can curate, you know, certain features that have interesting, uh, um, uh, you know, soil patterns that can be put into an online exhibition, like through story maps, or like Mary was talking about with, you know, folks that come back and do their masters, they don't, folk, you know, folk, somebody working on their graduate degree doesn't need to come here and look at the excavation records. We can just send them the link to all the um, excavation records online and they can bring all this information up. And then also we can develop, you know, apps in GIS that allow people to search on, you know, subfloor pits and all this, you know, the excavation records for subfloor pits can come up. So it really makes for an exciting, some exciting possibilities and figuring out how to pair the collections, like with your question, Melanie, to the GIS records is really the, what I'm, what we're super excited about with the Cora is, you know, how to, you know, to be able to go from, you know, a looking at, say pipe bowls to go to where what unit they were excavated from and be, to begin to have a pairing of all that information. I have another question if uh, if we're if this is a good point to yeah. ask it. Okay. When and this is for both of you, uh, when you write your next book <laughs> what uh, kinds of what, what would you like to write about? What, what would be what topics would be included? This this subject of archaeology and you know is it's just so I mean, it's so broad you know. But if you were sitting down to write a book, what would be some of the things that you would highlight in in a book um, book kind of format? Mary, you go first. I think I know what you're going to say. <laughs> oh, I don't know if you know what I'm going to say because I, I, <laughs> I don't know exactly. So we have we have lots of ideas for mm -hmm. books, um, many of which I think uh, are really for edited volumes because there's so mm -hmm. many amazing people and voices that have done a lot of research um, around Montpelier. What I if if I was going to write my book, um, just the Mary book. I think a lot of what I would talk about in it would be how do you um, ask new questions of old collections? So what are the all the discoveries that are be waiting to be found? And that would include kind of looking um, uh, not just within the bounds of this property. I think it would be really interesting to, kind of as a person who lives in Orange to kind of think beyond the gates of this property and connect um, all the work that we've done here off the property. And there's, you know, folks that are asking those questions and are, and are thinking about those questions, but I would love to be 
part of that conversation of um, connecting to the rest of Orange, connecting to the rest of the community and then the rest of the region. And that's something that the descendant committee is really interested in, um, is kind of connecting beyond just the, the 2,700 acres, because the story of the enslaved community was beyond the 2,700 acres. Um, their relationships, their movement, the story of the Madisons was, but I would love to really look at um, new discoveries through our current collections. So what are all these stories that are be waiting to tell with that lens of connecting beyond the property? So, which I don't think is what you think I was gonna say, Matt. So. No, no, I, I, and that's, that, that's, that's really cool, Mary, because that's something that I've been thinking about a lot as well is that um, um, we've talked about it, but in, in different, different lines is, you know, for years I thought, you know, oh, I need, you know, want to write the definitive study of, you know, Montpelier and, uh, have, you know, and I always, you know, tradition, have, have thought along more traditional lines of, you know, what other, other archaeologists would want to hear about. And in many ways, it, it almost would be replicating what other archaeologists have done, but just having it focus on Montpelier. And the work we've been doing with the community over the past two years has really made me rethink that and go along much more along the lines of what Mary has said and try to figure out a way to have a volume that's a collaborative volume that answers, you know, addresses, addresses research topics that's important to the community and makes it a book that's relevant to the descendants, because that's something that I know, like having discussions with all of you all on expedition programs and on Zoom talks, you know, those are the questions I think interest everybody the most is what makes this interesting, not to an archaeologist who, you know, has this very, you know, sometimes we have very myopic view of things like, oh, like what, you know, how, what are the patterns of blue beads that are at a site? You know, and you all are like, what in the world? Blue beads? And you're the, those are pretty, but what does that mean? Is things make this relevant to what the people were at Montpelier and the, and the people that have the most connection to those people, you know, the, the, the ancestors are the descendants. I mean, long before Mary and I started digging at Montpelier or digging anywhere, the descendant community was very interested in their history at Montpelier. And long after Mary and I are gone and all of us are gone, the community is still going to be here interested in that. And if we're able to, you know, tap into that, that interest and knowledge base and make what we do here useful to the community, it's something I think is going to resonate with everybody and have it be a, a book or a volume that goes beyond just a certain group of plantation archaeologists, but one that has a much more uh, public reception. And I know I don't know about you, Mary, but one thing I'm very limited to in my writing is I'm more of a technical writer. I am never gonna be like an Ivernal Hume that writes these books that just you know are page turners. Um, <laughs> If anybody has any questions about this, I'll send you some of the academic papers I've written, and maybe you could help me with that writing. But but if I had to make my living writing books, I uh, I'm glad that my wife has a job at UVA. So it's but yeah, I think collaborative writing is is one thing that would really. I, I, and it sounds like you know Mary and I would both want to do. Yeah, and just sort of during my dissertation, I was able to write a couple of articles and pieces with um, the president of the descendant community I worked with on the site I did my dissertation on in Alexandria, Virginia. And those were always the best pieces. They were um, mm. uh, most enjoyable to work on and to write, but I always learned a lot through that process. And one of the things I really learned from working with her, she was a, a trained journalist. She had been a journalist um, in Washington, D.C. for decades. And so she had the gift of actually writing things people wanted to read, but also um, the importance of having her name on the stories and the pieces that were written was really important, not only to her, but for the community. So it wasn't me just telling their story, it was her being able to tell her own story with me contributing my expertise, my knowledge, my experience in the field. And so my dream book would never be just have my name on it. I think it would be something where each of the chapters could be 
co-authored with members of the descendant community or members, um, you know, other stakeholders, other people that have these questions. I really think that, um, and this is also not just because I, like Matt, also struggle with writing, but it's, it's uh, co-authorship is powerful. Having your name on something is incredibly powerful in the world of academia and the world that we sort of dabble or travel in. You know, it's currency in our CV to have your name as an author and we cannot act like that's not real. Um, and it's just as real for members of descendant communities and stakeholder communities as it is for us. Um, and that was one of the things that I really experienced working in Alexandria with the, the Fort Ward descendant community was how important it really was for them, not just to have their stories out there and their stories be told, but to be able to be the people who put it in their own words and had their name attached to it um, as well. Um, so that would, you know, in the dream book scenario, that would be a big part of it for me. Um, it's my own personal little like um, cross I like to die on is co-authorship. <laughs> <laughs> So we have only a few minutes left. So does anybody else have uh, a question for me or Matt? Did you guys like this? Would you want to do one again where you could just ask oh. us questions? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, if I'm not hogging things, mm -mm. how about a 25 cent overview of the site we're going to be working on next month? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you want me to go, Mary? Yeah, go. Because <laughs> I, 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 we, we actually have some kind of really exciting discoveries that we've made. Um, it's we are calling it the burn site because we basically don't know what it is, except for there's a lot of evidence for burning there. There's this um, there's a layer of, um, you know, of topsoil, an artifact rich layer that has a, a mix of artifacts. And then, you know, but mostly, um, you know, nails, a little bit of slag, some domestic material, but then you get into all this ash and charred wood and then this burnt, heavily burnt clay surface. And there appear to be two pits next to each other with a mound around them. And these are like pits that are like 16 feet by 16 feet. And um, our, um, uh, she, she was, yeah, Tessa, Tessa Honeycutt is on here. Uh, Tessa, Tessa is our, um, uh, our historic architectural uh, technician here at Montpelier, and we were, you know, bantering back and forth about what this site could be. You know, it, typically with a burn area, you think about like a brick clamp, where they're manufacturing, where the enslaved community was manufacturing brick, but there's just not enough brick debris there to be that. Was it a lime kiln? But there's not enough lime. There's a little bit of lime, a little bit of brick. But Tessa said, you know, what about a tobacco barn? You know, like a a, a, a flu. Uh, be, you know, flu heated tobacco barn. And that got us thinking about the tobacco barn we found just down the hill, which is the what was turned into a threshing barn in the 18 teens. And if they turn the if the enslaved community transformed that tobacco barn into a threshing barn in the 18 teens, and so it was no longer used for flu curing of tobacco, and there was still a need for that. Could this one be, and the date for the nails that are coming from the site we're digging out right now are, you know, there, there's cut nails in there. So it's being in the ceramic stew date to the 1820s. So the possibility, one among many, is possibly that it could have been, uh, and it has all the diagnostics of the burnt clay that we found at the tobacco barn, at the smokehouse, you know, a continual fire where you have this burnt clay surface. So we're getting what's fun about the archaeology is you start digging you start finding the artifacts you start you know mary starts looking at them we're looking at the deposits with chris and the team and you start coming up with you know going from something you know nothing about other there's some like squared off mounds there there's some and there's some burnt soil and you slowly start building this set of details and then this is way beyond a 25 second version sorry but uh, <laughs> it's it's exciting so we're it's just at the beginning phase of, of that of that study yeah i think unlike other sites that you all would have worked on we broke ground on it um last week before our expedition program and um aren't really going to work on it between then and now um because mm -hmm. we're going to go finish um 
document, you know, doing all the drawings, mapping, all of that kind of closing up of the farrier site and the blacksmithing site. So when y'all come, Debbie, when you come in October, you're right at the beginning of the process still, even though there's going to be about a month between when we open the units, there's not going to be anyone going back and working on it. So a lot of this figuring out process is going to happen when, when you're here, which is, I think, one of the most fun times to be on a site. And that's really what we're doing. We're doing this phase two. So phase one is find the things. That's the metal detecting. That's the SDP. Phase two is, okay, you found some things. What is it? That's what we're right in the middle of with, with this site and what we had done previously with the other two sites. And then phase three is the, now tell me everything about it. And so it's fun about the phase two, it's the figuring it out process. So then we can sit down and make those decisions, hopefully with members of, of the community, of the descendant mm -hmm. community and with ourselves and go, okay, what sites do we wanna know a whole lot about? What do we need to take a deep dive in more? Um, and that's really exciting. I think phase two is often the most exciting because it's that it's that moment of discovery that we talk about when you first pick up that artifact, but for a whole site, it's that, oh, it's a, this. <laughs> and phase two can be at our pace, which is nice. Usually phase three is like, oh, we're going to reconstruct this and we need to have you do the archaeology in six months. And we're like, ah, so... <laughs> But, uh, but uh, Debbie, you'll also get to meet Mark because Mark is coming on the October program as well. So uh, cool. look, looking forward to that. Anybody else have a question? Sort of. A... <clears throat> this was I... a lot of fun, though. I hope you'll do it again. Yeah. We will. Good job, Mary, on this suggestion. This was great. <laughs> and, and Sometimes the internet has good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It, and it reinforces, you know, Having, having discussions is what makes these so much fun and the back and forth, so. Uh, Matt, yeah, I, I think we can... I... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. I was gonna tell Matt that Carol Dove and I would like to get together to see what you have, you guys have in the spring or early summer because as before, we'd like to maybe get a small group to see if we can um, maybe help with some, you know, digs. So if, awesome. if you have any information, maybe you could um, get it to me and I'll get to her or to both of them, whatever. I'll, I'll send you both a note and CC Mary on that. So there's some definite possibilities. We, we, it's been um, quite, a, quite a while since we've done a descendant uh, um, expedition and we'd love to do that again. That was, um, your, your alls in 2015 was the first you know, dedicated one that we did, which is amazing. Yeah, that was Out amazing. Here. And thank to you both for this um, interaction that you've done. It was very interesting. Well, thank you all for attending and making these so, so what they are. Because without you, <laughs> just be married. <laughs> so. well, yeah, I had prepped questions in case anybody didn't have one. So if it just was Matt and I talking to each other, at least there was. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't, I, we didn't use one of those, Mary, is great. <laughs> but again, very good questions. Thank you for getting those in advance. <laughs> well, thank you guys. And we've got a, some really cool lunch and learns coming up um, for the next couple months. So hope to see you again. <laughs> you both. Okay. Thank you. I sent you a chat. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Matt, there's a chat for you there. Oh, thank you, Mark. I'll, I'll grab that before it um, it goes away. Okay, thanks. Cool, we'll do. Thanks, Mark. We'll send out notifications. Bye, everybody. All right. Have a good day. You too.